Sophie. Thanks. Very good. So uh, our final speaker today is Hafi Hannes Dattir from uh, Harvard, who will tell us about sequential discontinuities of scattering amplitudes. Please. Thanks. So I'm happy to, to present this work that I've been working on with Jake Bergelli, Andrew McLeod, my advisor Matt Schwartz, and Christian Virgo. And we've been studying sequential discontinuities of scattering amplitudes. So a motivation for studying discontinuities is that discontinuities probe the analytic structure, but can also be related to cuts of the corresponding Thymer diagram. And the cut computation is often easier, and just as Enrico discussed, we can then reconstruct the full amplitude using information about its discontinuities if we have a basis of rational functions for our Feynman integrals. So the questions that we've been trying to ask in this project are first what we can learn from studying sequential discontinuities of amplitudes. So that is taking discontinuities of this expression that we get here, how we relate these sequential discontinuities to cuts, and also when addressing these questions, we saw that it turns out to be necessary to put these discontinuities on a firmer mathematical ground and define them more precisely. So we've also been led to ask what we gain from, from such systematic treatment. So this is my outline. I'll start with discussing discontinuities and show you why we need more powerful tools than using plus and minus i epsilons to define sequential discontinuities. And using those tools, it'll, it will be natural to define discontinuities in different channels using monodromies. So by channels here, I mean that we would want to define discontinuities in each Mandel stem separately. And it will also turn out that kinematic regions will be important for these definitions. Then I'll go on to talk about relations between these discontinuities and cuts. And it will turn out that time order perturbation theory or old fashioned perturbation theory will, is a great tool to prove our results. I'll talk about previous work that has been done in this direction, which relates sequential discontinuities in different channels to cuts. And then I'll present some new results for relations between sequential discontinuities in the same channel and multiple cuts through the diagram. And then we have a new proof of the Steinman relations, which have already been mentioned here in the session. And we'll talk about which assumptions go into that proof in the end. So let me start by discussing the problems with the I epsilon definition of discontinuity. So if I take the discontinuity of the amplitude by subtracting the amplitude with all plus I epsilon, uh, no, sorry, subtracting the minus I epsilon expression from the plus I epsilon expression, then I get a function that's only defined on the branch cut that I'm crossing. So for example, if I take this log squared of s, and I define the discontinuity by taking the expression with s plus i epsilon minus the expression with s minus i epsilon, then this is really zero everywhere in the complex s plane, except if I'm precisely on this branch cut here. Then I take the difference of the function right above the branch cut and right below the branch cut. But it's not clear if I do this, how I am supposed to continue this function to the complex plane and how I'm supposed to take a sequential discontinuity. So it's not clear what the I epsilon prescription is of this expression here that I get out. So this is the first indication that we need a better definition of the discontinuity operator in order to take sequential discontinuities. The second problem is the following. We ultimately want to study the discontinuity in each Mendel stem separately. So here I've drawn an example of a box and the amplitude will depend on its mass is squared and then on the Mandel stems that I've labeled here as S, T, and U. And we would intuitively want to define the discontinuity in the channel S as the difference between the amplitude where I substitute S plus I epsilon uh, here, and then I subtract the amplitude with uh, S minus I epsilon over here. And ideally, I would want this to agree with cuts only in the S channel. So I would want this to agree with a vertical cut here through this diagram. But the problem is that the Mandel stamps are not all independent. So I can't blindly use this definition. So if I substitute 
for all the s's that I see in the amplitude, if I substitute that for the sum of the masses squared minus t minus u, then the discontinuity is always zero. And that may not agree with some other answer that I computed before. So that's obviously inconsistent and obviously a problem because the discontinuity should be invariant under this rewriting of the amplitude. So the resolution to both of these problems is to abandon the i epsilons and take monodromies instead. So we define the discontinuity in S as the monodromy of the amplitude as around the point S equals zero, which I take to be the singular point here, when we start in the region RS. So RS is the region in the space of complex Mandel stems where S is greater than zero, but all the other Mandel stems are less than zero. And the monodromy is the difference between the function that I compute here in RS, and then the amplitude as analytically continued around the singularity at S equals zero back to RS. So I take the difference between these two to get the discontinuity. So let me illustrate this example, uh, no, this definition with this example, the simple example here of a logarithm. So I define the logarithm of s plus i epsilon to be the integral of dx over x as integrated along this path here, gamma zero. So I integrate to a point that's right above the negative s axis, negative real s axis. And then the logarithm of s minus i epsilon will be the integral again over dx over, of dx over x, but integrated along this path gamma minus one here where I go below the singularity at s equals zero. And now I can take the discontinuity in s as the difference between the two values that I get from these two paths. And now I can also define the discontinuity of the log of s minus i epsilon by subtracting from this value that I get taking the path gamma minus one, subtracting from that the value that I get from winding once more around this point at s equals zero with this contour here, gamma minus two. And now it's totally natural to take sequential discontinuities because I can just act linearly on this expression here. And note in particular that the i epsilon notation doesn't capture this winding around s equals zero once more that I need to define this con discontinuity over here. So, it's important that this definition of the discontinuity agrees with the i epsilon definition that we're used to in the region RS, uh, because that's where we have our traditional cutting rules and we will ultimately wanna relate these discontinuities to cuts. And furthermore, this definition agrees with the cuts in the variable S because all other cuts in the region RS vanish. So what we get from the traditional cutting rules is that the discontinuity in the region Rs would be the equal to minus the sum of all cuts, but all the cuts that are not in S vanish anyway, which is why I can write cuts sub S here. And the cuts here are computed by the traditional cutting rules, which put particles on shell with positive energy flow across the cut. And furthermore, I wanna emphasize here that this definition results in a function on the complex space. And the machinery that we use to compute these monodromies are best captured by this operator, this monodromy operator, and the calculation of discontinuities and monodromies actually becomes algebraic, and taking sequential discontinuities corresponds to actually multiplying matrices. So that's a very powerful tool that we can use, and I'm not gonna go into the details of that here, but I'm happy to discuss it later. So, just to illustrate what I've just discussed with a simple example before we go into the discussion of cuts. So I've taken the example of a loop here and the term that we care about in this loop is that it will be proportional to a log of minus p squared minus i epsilon. And then the monodromy operator acting on this amplitude will be minus one over eight pi because I get a two pi i from this log here. And then we can compare that to the discontinuity, which we really define to be only defined on this slice r p2 squared. So I can put a theta function in the energy of p 
uh, in the discontinuity definition. And the cut will also be computed where this energy of the incoming particle is positive. So I also have a theta function here. And as we get in the usual cutting rules, uh, the discontinuity will be equal to minus the cut. So let me first review the traditional cutting rules uh, that we usually compute using the I epsilon prescription. So it's, they say that the discontinuity uh, of the amplitude is equal to minus the sum over all cuts. But it's very crucial here that the left-hand side of the cut has all plus psi epsilons for all of these propagators here, while the right-hand side of the cut has all minus psi epsilons. So there are a few proofs of the cutting rules. There is Kudkowski's proof, which uses the Lando equations. There is the tooth development proof, which uses the largest time equation. And then there is the proof in time order perturbation theory, which is most transparent, and I'll show you why in a minute. And it's also the proof that we found to be easily generalizable to taking multiple discontinuities and relating those to multiple cuts through a diagram. So before I go on, let me review time order perturbation theory. So we can write Feynman integrals or decompose Feynman diagrams into a sum of V factorial time order perturbation theory diagrams, where V is the number of vertices in this Feynman diagram here. So in time order perturbation theory, the vertices are ordered in time and time passes from left to right here. And all particles in all these diagrams are on shell while internal particles can be virtual in Feynman diagrams. In both diagrams, we have three momentum conservation at each vertex, but very crucially, we don't have energy conservation at each vertex here in time order perturbation theory. So for example, this diagram here would correspond to a spontaneous creation of three particles out of vacuum, two of which would later be annihilated by the incoming particle, but this vertex here obviously violates energy conservation. But since the sum of all these time order perturbation theory diagrams equal, uh, the Feynman, are equal to a Feynman diagram, then uh, there's overall energy and momentum conservation. And the sum of all of them is Lorentz invariant, but each individual diagram is not Lorentz invariant. And while Feynman diagrams are great for calculations and the calculation of time order perturbation theory diagrams quickly get out of hands because you have V factorial of them, so you quickly get a big number besides the fact that they're harder to compute to begin with, then time order perturbation theory is great for proofs and intuition because we can really think about these as on-shell particles traveling forward in time. So I've written out an integral here where I'm also going to use this to remind you of the Feynman rules for time order perturbation theory. So I integrate over the three momentum of the loop in these two diagrams. I get a sum of these two energy denominators, which I get for each vertex that I cross. And so for each vertex that I cross, I have to write a one over the energy of the initial particle here. And then I have to subtract the energies of all particles that would be in a virtual cut as I cross each vertex. So for example, for this diagram here, if I do a virtual cut when passing this vertex, I get twice the energy of P, and then I get the energies of K and omega P minus K here. And you can show in examples that, and you can prove more generally that these will always agree. So here you can do the K zero integral to show that these two expressions agree. So the advantages to using time order perturbation theory is that the energies are independent. So we can rotate the energies here um, while the Mandel stamp size I talked about before are not all independent. And another advantage is that we get one delta function for each cut in contrast with the covariant cutting rules where we replace each propagator with a delta function for each cut. So for example, if I have this triangle here, then for the cut C1, I would get two delta functions for these two propagators. But for this, prop for this cut T C2, I would get three delta functions for these three propagators. So we can relate the discontinuity of the amplitude to cuts by using this distributional identity here, that one over the energy plus I epsilon minus one over the energy minus I epsilon is equal to minus two pi I delta of the energy. And this is in contrast to 
when you write down um, this loop using uh, Feynman propagators and you start trying to replace those Feynman propagators with delta functions, the only thing you do is to open up loops. So it's hard to see, except if you use one of the proofs that I used before, uh, it's hard to see example by example how you put in these delta functions. So these are the results that we derived using time order perturbation theory. First of all, there is a result for same channel sequential discontinuity. So I take m discontinuities in the variable s of this amplitude in the region Rs, and I compute the discontinuities by using these monogamy matrices or monogamy operators m times, and that is equal to a sum over the amplitude computed with all plus psi epsilon and a combinatorial factor out front. So I'll show you in a minute how this works out in examples. We could also prove a formula for sequential discontinuities in different channels. So here I'm taking the discontinuity in S and then in T. And to relate those to cuts, it's crucial to be in a region RST, where both the cuts in S and in T can be computed. So this turns out to be equal to the sum of uh, cuts in both S and T. So let me talk about previous work that has been done. Uh, so in a paper by Abreu, Brito, Durr, and Gardi from 2014, they presented a formula for the relation between multiple cuts through an amplitude and the discontinuities of that amplitude. And they computed the cut in the kinematic region where all the cuts can be done. And they derived or they put forward uh, generalized I epsilon rules to compute those cuts. Um, they also computed discontinuities in a little bit different manner for how, from how we do it because they took the first discontinuity in the region RS1 and then analytically continued to take the second discontinuity in RS1, S2, et cetera. However, we can use a lot of their examples that they used to check these, this equation up here. For example, the one loop triangle and the two loop triangle and some boxes. And we could use a lot of those expression to also check our equations. So I'm rather going to present to you examples of sequential discontinuities in the same channel. And I'm going to start with a very simple example that basically illustrates this combinatorial factor and this need to sum over multiple cut diagrams. So I start with the amplitude with three bubbles here. And the term that I care about will be a logged cubed of minus p squared minus i epsilon. I can compute one discontinuity by doing one cut through each of these bubbles. So the plus dot 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 here represents diagrams that also contain one more cut through. But in our formula, we compute everything with all plus i epsilons. So if you only computed the diagrams with one cut through them with all plus i epsilons, you would only get this term here. However, both by applying the monogamy matrices, um, no, sorry, if we apply the monogamy matrices, or here we can just use the I epsilon definition for one discontinuity, there's no problem with that for one discontinuity, then we get these extra terms. And we can get those extra terms precisely from the two cuts and the three cuts through the same diagram. So this first discontinuity gets these contributions from these other doubly cut and triply cut diagrams because we're calculating everything with plus i epsilons here. And then we can go on to take more discontinuities and the sequential discontinuity applying it, the operator twice to the amplitude will have a log and then this constant term that comes from the triple cut and then the triple cut will just be a constant equal to the triple discontinuity. Now let me do a little bit more non-trivial example. I'm gonna present the two loop triangle here and I've written out only the functional form in terms of the Z and Z bar variables. So the amplitude depends on the metal stems but it's easier to write it out in these Z, Z bar variables that are related to the metal stems in this way here. 
And what I'm going to present is a sequential discontinuity in P2 squared. So what you can kind of maybe see from this expression is that it will be this log squared term of ZZ bar that will end up mattering for taking two discontinuities in P2 squared of this amplitude here. So what we have to do to figure out uh, what to, how to take discontinuities of this is that we rotate the energies, E1, E2, and E3, and we look at these rotations in the complex ZZ bar plane. So what I've done here, this orange curve, is a rotation in the energy E2 that will go from the region R2, pass through the region R star, which is the region where all the Mendel stems are negative and where the amplitude is analytic, and the discontinuity will be the monodromy, the discontinuity in P2 squared will be this monodromy as I go from R2 to this region R star and back. And we can see that that corresponds to going around the singularity at Z equals zero or Z bar equals zero. And the reason why I've written out only half of the plane here is because when we solve for the ZZ bars in terms of the Mendel stems, we get a second order equation so we choose here that the real part of Z is greater than the real part of Z bar, which is why we only get half here and have to identify these two points that the orange curve touches. So the end result of doing this computation using again the monodromy matrices is that the discontinuity in P2 squared twice applied to this amplitude is proportional to, with the same proportionality constant that it was here, it's proportional to a dialog in Z minus a dialog in Z bar. And then we can do the cuts through the diagram in this channel. And if we do that computation, we get the same expression with the same proportionality constant here, but with a factor of one half, which is very crucial in our formulas that the double discontinuity or the sequential discontinuity here of the amplitude is equal to twice the expression that we get from the cut when we do this in the same channel p2 squared. So now let me talk about the Steinman relations which say that the amplitude cannot have sequential discontinuities in partially overlapping channels. So here I've illustrated this with an example and what this means is that the amplitude cannot contain a term of the form log s log t here because these two channels are partially overlapping. They both contain this particle here, but it can contain a term like log s log u because s and u are not overlapping channels here. And as discussed earlier by Lance, this is important for bootstrapping amplitudes. And there is an old proof in S matrix theory by Steinman in 1960 which was a non-perturbative proof and used unitarity. But we have a new proof in time order perturbation theory that applies to individual Feynman integrals. So let me briefly sketch that proof. The proof in time order perturbation theory goes as follows. Each energy denominator in time order perturbation theory will depend on an energy. And as we go through the diagram and write down the different energy denominators, then each, as we cross each vertex, we get a new set of energies, but each energy is a subset of the sequential ones. And for that reason, we cannot have sequential discontinuities in partially overlapping channels because these energies will end up corresponding to the Mandel stems, the corresponding Mandel stems. But the assumptions that we have to put into this proof is first of all, that the region where we take the sequential discontinuity, for example, if we have S and T, then we want to take the sequential discontinuity starting in the region where S is greater than zero and T is greater than zero. That region may not exist for real energies and momenta when some of the particles are massless. Also, if some of the external masses are zero, that then our proof also doesn't work because we're rotating the energies. And as we're rotating the energies, we're changing these masses of the external particles. And furthermore, since we're doing again an energy rotation, we're not constraining branch points at infinity. We're only constraining branch points at lower values of the metal stems that we have. So that brings me to my results. 
Um, so this is what we went through. We defined discontinuities as monodromies around singularities for the reason that this gave us a function that we could take a sequential discontinuity of. So we needed to abandon the I epsilon notation. And it's important that we start in a kinematic region where we're, when we're computing this monodromy, we're starting in a kinematic region where the cut can be performed and then analytically continuing the amplitude to the Euclidean region and back and taking that difference. I also mentioned briefly that the monodromy matrices make calculations of monodromies algebraic and we can actually multiply together matrices to get the different monodromies. And then we talked about how time order perturbation theory is useful to prove results about both same channel discontinuities and different channel discontinuities. So for same channel discontinuities, which is what I showed examples of, we needed a sum of diagrams that were cut up multiple times with a certain combinatorial factor. But for different channel discontinuities, we needed to sum over diagrams that are cut in both the channels, or I displayed a formula for two channels and two discontinuities, but we can generalize it. Um, so it's a sum of diagrams that are cut in both those channels in a kinematic region where all of those cuts can be performed and computed. And then I talked about the Steiner relations, which say that the amplitude cannot have sequential discontinuities in partially overlapping channel, and talked about a new proof that in time order perturbation theory, but we had to put in some assumptions, for example, that the external particles cannot be massless, and the region where we compute uh, the monotromy has to exist. So thanks everyone for coming, and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, let's thank Hopping. Uh, okay. Do we have any questions? Uh, Enrico? Uh, hi, thanks for this nice talk. Um, so you said uh, in regions, like we can compute this discontinuity when these regions exist. Do we have a, a priori knowledge of when this region exists? And the second yeah. question is, do you need to rely, do you have to, all the Feynman integrals that you can do this uh, procedure with, do they have to have a Euclidean region? Because we know there are certain Feynman integrals that just don't have a Euclidean region. Yeah, so for the first question, if all the particles are massive, so also the internal particles, then we know that this region exists. But if some of the internal particles are massless, for example, even if you take the external particles to have masses, then it may not exist. So then we're looking at it kind of on a case to case basis. Um, we have not looked at examples that don't have a Euclidean region. Um, we could certainly, certainly do the same energy rotation. So maybe that's something to look into and see what answer we get then. And we have a question from Lance, next. Hi, Hovi. Hey. Um, a long time ago, Mandelstam found the Mandelstam representation. Mm -hmm. So he discussed d double discontinuities in S and then in T. And I believe what he had to do was <clears throat> move the discontinuity in one channel over into a region, analytically continue it over. So he must have had a way to define the discontinuity that was not just on the cut, right? Yeah, so I mean, our definition of the discontinuity is motivated, of course, by the fact that we wanted to relate it to cuts. So of course, you can define discontinuities in any way you want. As you say, you can analytically continue the amplitude to some other regions and define a different quantity. Um, but since we wanted to relate those to cuts and we had the tools to do that, defining the discontinuity in this region, that's the formula we present. Does that make sense? Yeah, I just wondered if it was related to how Mandelstam did the uh, discontinuity. Yeah, so that's, that's something we've been looking into. Like when do these agree? Like when does it agree basically if we go back, see, let's see to this picture here. Like, can I start here, take a discontinuity passing through RT, or can I equivalently, in some cases, go over analytically continue to RS, pass through R star, and then go back? 
uh, but it's not, it doesn't work in all examples for sure. So I'm not exactly sure when they agree, but that's something to look into. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, we have a few more questions. Uh, David? Oh, I'd like to make a remark about a problem that I believe is unsolved. Uh, I've yeah. discussed it quite a lot with um, Dirk Kreimer and his group in Mainz. Mm -hmm. And it concerns the two-loop triangle with arbit six arbitrary internal masses and three arbitrary external masses. Okay. For the one-loop triangle, we know that there are certain combinations of internal and external masses that uh, give what are called anomalous thresholds, places where you... Uh, the imaginary part doesn't come from just cutting uh, two lines inside there and then in fact given by the leading Landau singularity when all three internal massive particles are on shell which can happen for certain things it occurs in the um, uh, form factor of the deuteron um, to my knowledge that's not been investigated even for the planar two loop diagram but there is a paper by Bas Tausk who just investigates it numerically. He takes Kreimer's representation of the two-loop diagram and shows that there's an anomalous threshold um, which um, uh, uh, coincides with the one-loop anomalous threshold. But in general, that problem um, has escaped analytical investigation. That's so very interesting. Thanks. Thanks I for putting that out. And, 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 and the paper is by Tausk and others about um, 15 years ago. Great. Thanks. Okay, next up, Nima. Well, since you're using uh, old-fashioned um, uh, perturbation theory, old-fashioned mm -hmm. perturbation theory is just perfect for calculating something like the vacuum wave function uh, instead of scattering amplitude. Of course, it's also great for a scattering amplitude, as, as you're mm -hmm. showing. Have you, have you thought about whether um, there are Steinemann relations or analogs of Steinemann relations for the uh, vacuum wave function? So yeah. again, you, you should get uh, you know, uh, we, we can now talk about logs and so on as a function of sums of energies, for example, for, uh, for the case of uh, massless particles. Um, uh, uh, clearly, there are patterns of things that don't show up together that look an awful lot like ordinary Steinman relations. Have you uh, yeah. looked at that? Yeah, I mean, I looked at it um, in December, and what I concluded then was that we can definitely apply this story to the wave functions because a lot of this doesn't require unitarity at all, and it's just a relation between different functions where you substitute the plus i epsilons with minus i epsilons, or more generally, you take monodromies or wind down in a complex space. And so I think it probably hasn't been worked out, but we could definitely work out relations that would constrain those wave functions. And a question from Simon. Yeah. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, I have uh, one comment and one question. Yeah. Uh, the comment is, uh, is about uh, Steinman's old paper. Yeah. Uh, of course, it's in German, which I can't read. But uh, my understanding of that paper was that the, that part about the Steinman relation came from looking at uh, correlation functions as a function of real momenta and complex energies, mm -hmm. which I believe is, 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 is conceptually very similar to this uh, uh, time order perturbation theory that that you're using. So it's really treating time on the, as far as I understood, uh, time was treated on a very different footing in that, uh, in that approach too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My question is about uh, the restriction to massless particles. So, so can, yeah. I, I missed that part. Can you repeat a bit why, uh, why you need to uh, avoid them? Yeah. So for the external massless particles, let me go back to the slide. Mm -hmm. um, so the reason is that we're doing all of this construction and we're computing the discontinuities by varying the energies and right. not the three momenta. So by varying the energies, we're varying the external masses. So we can't fix the external masses to anything. And in particular, we can't fix them to zero. Um, and for internal massless particles, what can happen is that this region where we compute these diagrams. So the reason why the proof holds is because the diagram can exist in time order perturbation theory. It's just zero. Um, but the region where we conclude that has to exist because otherwise it's not relevant, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so it can happen and you kind of just have to look at a case to case basis or I don't have yeah. a general formulation. But if there are massless internal particles, uh, this region may not exist. 
I see. Yeah. So it's okay. Uh, yeah. Maybe a comment on that. Is, I'm not so sure, but there was a recent work by Ashok Sen where you look at amplitudes where, in addition to complexifying energy, yeah. it also allows one of the momenta to be complex. So you, you don't allow like the full tree momentum to be complex because, yeah. uh, as as David pointed out, you will run up into very complicated uh, numerous treasures and things like this, but they seem to be able to say reasonably simple things about uh, that case where you have only two directions are complex. Yeah, that's interesting. So that, that might be useful to look at uh, for massless particles. Yeah, and honestly, I think this construction works in other examples too, and like it's not restricted to these scattering amplitudes using time order perturbation theory because these, yeah. this construction is more general. Um, yeah, I was interested specifically in string theory. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's something to look into, definitely. But I guess uh, one comment is that I think Ashok Sen was restricting to massive external states as well. Mm. He was projecting out the masses once. Um, so next, we have two more questions. One from Samuel. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so I, I have a question about the, the iterated discontinuities on, on the same channel. So yeah. back when we were looking at these things, we, we, the reason to exclude those ones is that it wasn't clear to us how to relate it to the, to the uncut interval. In the sense that if I take a single cut or if I take iterated cuts on different channels, mm -hmm. I can, uh, there is a, well, I can compute a, a dispersive integral and then I have a clear way to, to take this information that I got from the cuts and go back to the full uncut function. Yeah. Is there a similar thing that I can do with iterated discontinuities on the, on the same Yeah, channel? so the way we resolve that is to rewrite everything basically in terms of all plus i epsilons or so that we're on the principal sheet of the amplitude that we're computing. And then we can add up all the amplitudes and they all end up having plus i epsilons everywhere. Um, so that's this expression here where it's important that this m is computed with all plus i epsilons. And that's why that's the origin basically of this combinatorial factor. And we're summing up, as I say, over multiple cut diagrams. So for example, to get the correct answer for the bubbles that I showed here, uh, it's not sufficient to just take one cut um, through the bubble to get this expression computed with all plus i epsilons. I mean, what I would normally do is that I would put minus i epsilons on the right hand side of the cut. But here we instead compute everything with plus i epsilon so that we can add up all the diagrams, all the time order perturbation theory diagrams to get the Feynman diagram results. But then we have to add these multiple cut diagrams. Okay, but, but, but in this slide, so if, if the information that I add was the, the last line, this uh, this cubed uh, M, yeah. Yeah. How would I know? Uh, would I know how to then lift this back to the full uncut function, or in a in a, in a in a yeah for maybe for the bubble I would, but for a more complicated diagram? Um, I'm not sure in the general case okay. if you had only the information about the disk cubed here. Okay, thanks. And we have the last question from Chung. Uh, I have a question uh, and a comment. Uh, mm -hmm. In the case of Mendelssohn representation, by extension for the Steinman relation, it's really applied to the physical region. There's no uh, double discontinuity in the physical region. So Mendelssohn discontinuity is outside of the physical region. So in what sense you're applying Steinman relation to a four-point function? Yeah, so I mean, it's crucial here that as I say, the region where we compute the discontinuities exists. That's where we put a constraint using the Steinman relations. So you're absolutely right that for some amplitudes, if I compute the discontinuity using some other prescription than what we presented, um, then this region may not exist and you can still compute these monodromies in the complex space. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you don't get, then that's, I mean, the fact that the region has to exist is an assumption that we put into our proof of the center relations. Well, as Lance pointed out, there is a double spectral representation, Mendes and Schoen, that's in, outside the physical region. Mm -hmm. So are you going to the M physical region to 
then there, the Steinman relation doesn't hold in that region. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's true. And as we were discussing earlier, those discontinuities are computed differently from how we compute them, right? I mean, we define them differently. And that's, that's the restriction that we're putting on the amplitude. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Do we have any more questions? If not, then let's, uh, we have a question from Alessandro. Yeah, hi, sorry, uh, I had a comment regarding what Samuel said. And uh, I think his question was, I mean, as he said, his question was not related to the easy three bubble example, but if you go to the triangle part, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, his argument was that at some point, if you take cuts, for example, in P1, you would mm -hmm. have a double and then a triple cut. But of course, if you, this is how you define the discontinuity. But then if you want to take, for example, the cut over the two boxes, so you cut the triangle and then you cut the box in the P1 channel, then mm -hmm. how, how can you relate this to the integral? And at least as far as I understand it, is the fact that you get a subpart of the integral, which is the one contributed to that. So you're still, even if you can resolve the two discontinuities in the S channel, you would miss a part, which is the, the triple cut contribution. I mean, do you, do you guys do something different? Can you get all the answer from the, the double cut or, or not? Um, so as I say, for specific examples, I'm not really sure yet. This is the restrictions that we're putting um, and presenting. Uh, the way we reconstruct the full amplitude is, I guess, future work. Okay, so, okay, thanks. You're welcome. Do we have any more questions? If not, then let's thank Kofi and all of the speakers from the afternoon session once again. Thanks for coming and thanks for the invitation. So this concludes the official part of the conference. Uh, do the